All right, good. Denise? presentation I will first uh, talk about my career research plans and then I will talk about the creative process of research more broadly uh, um, so that I can tell you about my own research experience and, uh, and explain how it relates to my creative process um, and I will talk about the outcomes of my research and the lessons learned. So prior to starting the research rotation I wanted to focus on the medical humanities and I had three projects uh, that I was thanks to work on. One was uh, the pro project on the e-cigarette advertising campaign with Dr. Jacker. I was also planning to do a project on the history of reflux disease uh, with uh, Dr. Nicolette Damros. And I also had sort of started working on the project on epistemology of medicine, epistemology being the study of knowledge with uh, one of the philosophy professors on campus. Um, so why the medical humanities? Um, I happen to be one of the untraditional medical I studied something else in college. I studied uh, philosophy as well as chemistry. And uh, between medical school and residency, I also spent time at Kansas in the Eastern Department of Medical Science. But um, why more broadly should we care about the medical humanities at a time where the humanities are doing so bad? Ever since the financial crisis in 2007, um, the vocational um, impulse to go into the humanities is really dropping across the country. But paradoxically, in medical schools, the interest in the medical humanities is increasing. And that's not just in the US across um, all the top medical schools, but also in, uh, in foreign countries. Um, and more recently, I read an article about uh, the surge in uh, medical humanities in the Chinese medical schools, where there are lots of um, violence incidents, doctors, and the hope is that medical humanities are going to improve the relationship between patients and doctors. Um, so, um, uh, after my research talk, um, the feedback that I got was that I should focus on uh, knowledge in medicine because that was a new topic and, uh, and because there was very little written in that, uh, in that subject. Um, so at that time, the questions that, um, that I was interested in were um, why, why is there an uh, emphasis on bias in research uh, now more than the previous ones? Why is there, why did PBM come around? And I was also interested in the idea of scientific pluralism as a model to understand um, um, knowledge in medicine. Uh, now, um, prior to carrying on and talking about um, my experience with uh, research, I will just briefly touch upon the creative process uh, in general and as applied to my research project. Um, so a few years back, I um, came across the work of um, um, of uh, uh, David Gallinson, he's a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, and, um, and even though his specialty is uh, labor economics, he uh, got very interested in the process, in the creative process, and looked at how um, scientists, artists, and writers um, come up with innovations on their specific patterns. And he noted that there are two different types of innovators, there are the conceptual and the experimental. Conceptual innovators are finders. So they basically start with a very clear idea of their goal and then they execute it. They have <coughs> precise problems that they solve. And usually they make spectacular breakthroughs very early on in their careers. Um, examples of that would be Picasso, Einstein, or T.S. Eliot, who um, basically came up with their major works early on in their career. And then there are the experimental innovators who are the seekers. They start with more imprecise goals and they work by trial and error. They make discoveries and are created through the process of searching. And usually they make their contribution later in life. And, um, and examples of, of these types of innovators would be Cezanne, uh, Darwin, and Robert Frost, who had uh, more significant roles in the later part of their career. Now, I'm not saying that I'm one of them, but I just want to say that I think that uh, my research project was co closer to this type of um, uh, approach, the experimental approach, I think that I didn't have a very specific goal, but I found 
found um, a lot of um, inspiration and um, uh, new ways to think about mental health as I was doing the process of the IM. And so my research began, and it began um, on the quads with Dr. Uh, Professor Longino. She's a professor of philosophy of science, and she's very well known for her work on uh, science as social knowledge. inquiry as a social process um, and that um, scientists um, will assume um, background assumptions as a community that will guide their hypothesis production and their interpretation of data and as long as they're aware of these background assumptions they're not going to be um, uh, their objectivity is not going to be endangered. Uh, Dr. Longino was uh, very ambitious. She uh, told me to read a lot of books and I spent a lot of time philosophy books, which I really enjoyed, but after a while I felt that I was steering away from um, a more practical goal that I had to find new creative ways to produce knowledge to myself. Um, so I went back to the medical school and um, I talked to the following people. I talked to Stephen Goodman, who is a professor of medicine and he's also working in clinical and computational research, and his interest is uh, looking at mathematical frameworks um, to um, evaluate the truth of findings. Um, and he basically agreed with me, he gave me more references, but he agreed with me that looking at what philosophers write is probably not going to be that fruitful because philosophers tend to use examples that are somewhat simplified um, and are disconnected from the complexities of medical philosophy. Um, I also talked to uh, David Magnus, you may know him as the ethicist on call. Um, he was also very helpful. He really enjoyed uh, my ideas, and uh, because he himself wrote his uh, thesis as a as a graduate student on knowledge of medicine, and um, and he he suggested that I should actually have a qualitative approach where I do structured interviews of uh, of attendees and uh, residents and uh, analyze um, the interviews from a qualitative um, approach and uh, and draw conclusions from there. Um, and uh, I, um, after talking to Dr. Messner, who uh, suggested that I um, uh, look into the work of uh, Richard Rosenfeld, who's the editor in chief of the Wharf Journals and has been uh, really one of the um, um, uh, leading figures in trying to uh, improve the quality of, um, of data, of, uh, of research in the ENT. Um, so I met with Dr. Rosenfeld at Crossham and we shared a few uh, ideas. He suggested that I should. Um, clinical practice back then in groups, um, and he also offered me many ideas, one of them being to focus on control groups in EMS philosophy too, because we tend to overlook the um, uh, control groups when we do or RCTs when we're interpreting the intervention, so they're somewhat biased. Um, and then, of course, in our own department, I talked to several people. Um, Dr. Jacker was uh, very supportive. He uh, um, also came up with uh, an idea. He thought that um, maybe looking at uh, uh, retrospective uh, chart reviews that um, are actually followed by a perspective study would be an, a nice thing because um, a lot of ENT articles will end up saying, um, uh, of, of the chart reviews will end up saying uh, perspective study is uh, required to validate your data, uh, but oftentimes that, that, that is not done. Um, Dr. Metzner directed me to Dr. Rosenthal, Dr. D.B. had also uh, a lot of ideas, including looking at the evidence for the treatment of uh, teens from a cell carcinoma. Um, and Dr. Madri was just generally very enthusiastic about um, my projects and supportive. Um, so through interacting with uh, all these uh, people, I came across um, the center, the metric center, that was actually just being launched as I was doing uh, so metrics stands for Meta Research Innovation Center, Center and it's led by Dr. Nidis and also Dr. Goodman, whom I talked about earlier. And, uh, and the idea of, uh, of metrics is to um, look at essentially at uh, research on research, establish trends um, in research, to so get uh, biases more broadly, and, um, and see how research can be done better and how we can incentivize So essentially, meeting all these people led me to establish a framework to think about knowledge and medicine uh, in ENT. And, 
them and that led me to more potential roles as well. Um, so just very briefly because I talked about it during the um, resident symposium, um, let me just give you a, a broad sense of um, epistemology and how it's important to ENT. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Um, Um, and surprisingly, even though we spent innumerable hours learning and reading, um, instead that half of what we learned will no longer be true within 10 years. Um, and then I was, um, and then there is this thought journey in the literature that maybe EDM is a symptom of crisis in our epistemology. Um, so why should we care about knowledge in ENT? Because knowledge drives or decision about um, surgeries, and surgeries are invasive, they're expensive, and also, um, as academic ENT, we, we determine we care a lot about knowledge production and dissemination. Um, so there are many sources of knowledge of, in ENT, and more uh, uh, particular to um, uh, surgeons, uh, visual perception and mechanistic thinking are very important for cognitive processes, and that's what we do when we operate. Broadly, when we look at issues in the knowledge of uh, in ENT, there are two broad categories of issues. One is the quantity of data and information. Uh, we're in a situation of information paradox where there is a lot of information and it's very accessible, but it's very hard to measure. Um, and then there are issues of um, quality with the slow uptake of uh, evidence-based med medicine within our field. Evidence-based medicine is uh, uh, relies on an Critical approach um, to uh, knowledge production in that uh, observed data is more important than theory, and that's things like the rationalism, uh, where uh, understanding the mechanism of disease is more important um, than observed data. Um, and this tension between these uh, two ways of thinking in medicine have been in existence since uh, antiquity. And in the 20th century, um, those tensions were uh, very strong, with on the one hand, And, uh, and understanding basic science, uh, following the collection of reports, publication. Um, and on the other hand, um, some doctors need to go to population studies to understand how to treat individual patients, which eventually led to the birth of EDM and others. Um, so um, there is a slow uptake of evidence based medicine across all surgical specialties. And the reason for that. On the one hand, um, there, is, um, there is a problem where surgical innovations um, and their assessment is unregulated, which is in contrast with pharmaceutical uh, treatments. Um, there is also an issue with academic promotion. The, the field of surgery is very busy. They spend a lot of time in the operating room, and they don't have a lot of time left to do research. Um, and then we as surgeons tend to think in terms of mechanisms, so we're somewhat biased towards a more rationalist approach. Also. Uh, other challenges um, uh, result from designing RCTs in surgery. Um, RCTs in surgery are much more expensive. They require more time and medicine. There's an issue of steady power in the recruiting. The, number, the necessary number of patients for these RCTs is much more complicated uh, for, for surgical trials. There are some issues regarding the ethics of sham surgery. And more broadly, surgical interventions are very complex. Any levels of uncertainty as diagrammed here. Um, so, is, are there bad consequences to, delag, uh, to this lag of, in the adoption of EDM? Well, yes, because um, NIH funding is declining um, for, for surgeons compared to other uh, areas of medicine. And also, there is a risk that policy making or guidelines will be favoring medical treatments over surgical interventions because they're not providing the robust uh, data. Um, so this led me to the idea of applying meta research to surgery, um, and I think that meta research can help us identify signs of surgical practices, um, but also help us trace or knowledge base and increase the value um, of research. I'm working on several projects currently with uh, uh, Dr. Benitez, um, and um, I have currently four projects. Uh, the first one is uh, looking at the sequestration problem, where 
um, surgical interventions are not compared to medical interventions, but surgical interventions are compared among studies and surgical medical interventions. How often does that occur? Um, we also want to measure the sham surgery effect by uh, comparing RCTs of sham surgery to RCTs of surgery versus no intervention. Uh, we also want to do a head-to-head -head comparison of surgical and medical interventions. Um, and, uh, and then finally, we're doing a project on surgical case series and their subsequent validation. So um, basically, what we'll be doing is looking at the proportion of surgical case series that are further validated by uh, research through this project. And in addition to these projects, I've been working on other projects. Um, I also worked on the Stanford experience with uh, pediatric airway evaluation, uh, creating a database for that, and we'll be submitting. Uh, I've also worked on the history of uh, reflux. Um, I have all the primary uh, sources now. Um, my only problem at this point is that the first book that mentioned reflexive disease is in German, and my German is very rusty. Uh, so <laughs> I just have to spend some time with Google Translate. Um, there are many Germans in this country, so you can um, call them out. Okay. <laughs> and Albert's there. Yes, that's true. So outcomes of the research. So the positive outcomes was that I met some fabulous people on campus um, and found some inspiring mentors uh, across disciplines. And I really feel that I took advantage of uh, the large intellectual uh, life of uh, Stanford. Um, and also, I was able to, I think, establish a framework to think about the issues that were important to me. And um, also, I defined some long-term research objectives. And um, I think that this is something that I would want to carry on in the future. Um, and I will, next week, uh, be partaking in the Spectrum clinical intensive course. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, some negative aspects. Well, I currently do not have any publication yet that resulted from this uh, work. Um, and that will be my primary goal is a um, and I think that I have too many projects, which um, which makes it difficult to complete um, one. Um, what are the welcome to the real world? <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what were the lessons that I learned? Uh, well, uh, four and a half months is a very short time for an experimental approach to research, and even though uh, it really satisfied my um, intellectual needs and was a great experience. I don't know if I would recommend that to everyone. Um, I would also be very cautious about committing to multiple projects because, again, it's better to complete at least one to two projects rather than spreading yourself too wide and not finishing anything. And I think it's very important to be passionate uh, because research can be very frustrating and time consuming. And if you're not, if you don't care about what you're doing, you're probably not going to want to finish anything. And you're going to get very upset. Um, and then finally, try to finish your project before starting your clinical rotations because uh, finding time uh, during clinical rotations can be challenging, but it's not complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, uh, a note for the juniors. So um, I think that my experience was um, doing with, uh, the research uh, second was um, came with uh, some drawbacks, but it was nice to. Um, because I think that if you do the research first, then you have more time to work on that stuff you can present to the academy. You have more time to work on your research during the third year. And um, and also you have more time to do it in preparation for the insert. That's something you care about. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that when it comes to the three or four questions on epistemology, we're all set. <laughs> no, uh, you know, that's very true. I mean, we don't try to make our grand rounds a complete educational series. It's a highlight of interesting things, and at times intellectually interesting and broadening areas. I talk in electronic signals, right? What's that got to do with it? Head and neck, it does have some relevance. But I think it's interesting to be broad, but nothing. Um, replaces the quiet time that you sit reading. And you've got to go through major textbooks. You're going to think especially relevant to every patient that you see. The people that fall behind are people that try to cram, you know, as in the test in college. You just have to build that knowledge of 
right along throughout residency. And the people who do well and aren't stressed about it, and frankly bring a knowledge base forward to superior patient care, are people who just make it part of their lives. And using the interstices of the day, and downtime between cases, a little tough to be social, but also pull out a couple of papers in there. Just get that reading habit and sustain it is crucial to building your knowledge, because time slips by, you know? How long ago did you just begin, right? And here already you're here. Just need to keep reading. Yeah, absolutely. So that was another recommendation that I had. Um, have a reading schedule and stick to it. And then um, just cover your campus and always be social. Just send it out of family. So for Green Lane, Reading Room, and it was wonderful. Um, do some sports. I did the relay with uh, Matthew Messner, and it was wonderful. I really recommend that everyone does it, but especially if you're on your research rotation. And then catch up with your case dog. I had a lot of catching up to do, and I made the resolution <laughs> to not fall behind. Then, of course, spend some more time with your loved ones because uh, they're not more compelling to us. There you go. Merci to everyone. And uh, thank you for Any questions? Did you really read all those books? I mean, not not, 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 Okay, I just want to okay, you understand that. All right, so you're saying Research 
I mind it kind of how that guided me through my project. Some of the roadblocks and some of the, the things I think are key to success for the future of the science is things like in fine arts or going through research. So uh, when we picked the project, you know, with facial nerve uh, injury, there's you know significant psychosocial uh, effects to people, uh, and we have pretty much we have we don't have very uh, varied options for treatment of that. So our goal of the paper was to see investigate the immune system's role and the uh, nature of the this, uh, blood stain injury. So we looked at the complex cascades, but specifically MS, and four things we wanted to look at were what were the role of the complex cascade, how did it function in facial differences in age and in survival, which I'll discuss briefly, and develop a tool for effectively measured and monitored uh, just the uh, function of the very function of the virus. So briefly about the background, um, there's several things that are important in patient nerve recovery. Um, this the adaptive and innate immune systems are both uh, prevalent in nerve regeneration. Uh, so when you look at the survival of, of the nerves, there's several things that I've, I've kind of, I've, I've made it kind of brief, but these are three key important things to look at. So the facial motor nucleus is cell body has to survive, and there's a di there's a difference in the maturation and and and, 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 age and phenomena. It's, it's the same right between juvenile and adult mice. There's a pretty critical time period for maturation of the nerve that, is, that needs to be met for it for robust survival to be met. Uh, clearance of clearance of myelin is also very important, and it's kind of been cited as a possible difference between the central and peripheral nerve system why it repairs that. Of course, you want axonal regeneration to occur, uh, which is the wiring to the nerve. Uh, so I simplified some of the, the basic science and the, the immune system because we kind of know some of the things about malaria degeneration. But specifically, looking at complements role in there, the, uh, the classical or complement pathways don't be involved in that. And with the C1Q, what you see here is kind of the start of the cascade. Uh, so I'm not going to go specifically into all the details of the cascade, um, but uh, the main points to note about the complement cascade is that the uh, obstinins are sent to help clear debris. The chemotactic factors are provided that, uh, that recruit macrophages and other uh, blood derived uh, cells and complex. And the, 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 the end result of the complement cascade is the membrane tap complex, which stays in uh, a role in upregulating the cell system and converting to myelin three. Uh, so, two things to note about this is that you know, in the immune system, is, it can be a double edged sword. So when we, when, we, when we need it, it's very good, and sometimes if it's over aggressive, we can get uh, injuries or other structures, such as in, uh, in our, which, in which was the, the hypothesis in our project. This was demonstrated by this lab by Romaglia that showed in a, a, similar, a similar study looking at rat, fun, uh, rat function and uh, sciatic nerve crush injury that when you make it in the complement system, there is improved sensory and functional recovery and axonal regeneration. Our hypothesis based on all these things of the complement deficiency would help to improve patient motor nuclear survival, improve functional recovery, and improve uh, recovery in juvenile mice. Um, so we had three groups in the adult groups, uh, 21, 57 of the mice. They were heterozygotes, wild type knockouts. I'll show you briefly a picture of the surgery that was done here. This is the study we have from the, the, the reason to, and I'll discuss later about the reasons that we think this presents. Behind you, 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 for 30 seconds. And it's calibrated with a, a, a pair of forceps that has that it demonstrated that gives it a consistent course of release. So at the end of the, the, end of the surgery, uh, you can see that there, there's two pieces of the nerve here. The, 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 the nerve is intact here, but it's been connected to this one. We worked with our, our partners at uh, Santa Clara University, uh, the bioengineering department, to um, Help us with the measurement of the patient nerve function. This is, this is one of the challenges of this of this project. Was before prior to this, uh, we met. We, this was monitored with with video cameras and two different observers watching over a couple of minutes and then rating the, the whisker function. So we wanted to give a more objective data point. So the surgery is usually performed on the left side. So this is this is the use of 
our high speed camera. These mice can move their whiskers up depending on age and species up to 50 times per second. This camera captures up to 500 frames per second. So we looked at post ops over a three week period. There was some data to reply to, and this is a picture on the bottom of our, our setup here of the high speed camera over it. This, this was a, a process of figuring out how to optimize the camera settings. You see that the mice, if the heads are moved, they're not fits. So we, uh, we bribed them with food. <laughs> <laughs> It's not, not all the time that it worked, but it was uh, it was a you know process of working working this out to make sure that we could and working with our our, our patriots at, at Santa Clara University engineers to make sure that we kind of got the optimal settings there. You can also see that there's a bunch of whiskers there, so eventually we we saw that they were having problems tracking the whiskers. I'll go into a little bit about how we tracked it because that was also also pretty interesting how we worked through that problem. So I, I don't have a video of this, but again, you can look at it on the on the left side of the screen. This is a video of a still frame of how the, the mouse head is pictured. You can see a little bit of food. So, and they developed a uh, they use they, they developed their own system to kind of look at um, tracking here. This is a novel system with some MATLAB software that was already there. And also on that top right screen, you'll see that there's a, a pinpoint of the, the mouse. I don't know if everyone can see that, uh, but they developed angles uh, based on fixed points on the head to kind of track. Um, to basically minimize the movement of the head when, when we're, we're factoring our calculations. And on the bottom right, you can see that there's a whisker that's outlined here. Uh, so, so, so they look at the angle of deflection based on these lines to kind of determine uh, how much movement we're doing. And we can compare those to, to each side as there's the control. So it's actually um, a not line they did. So we looked at our data analysis here. Um, these are the two sides here. and. Um, one on the top right, that's a right side of uh, the script. Page 11 on the top left is also a right side of the script. So we, we looked at cycles of mouse of whisker movement over three cycles, uh, which varied with time. This is all very useful. But uh, we look, we're, we're still in the, in the process of, of analyzing this and coming up with uh, an exact formula to predict this as well. So it is all this has been a process in, in itself. So when I, looked, when I went back to my timeline, this is what I originally presented. Um, Last year, I was also a late research person like Thais. Uh, I looked at I, I, when I was making the, the presentation or the, the timeline. I really didn't look at kind of what, what are these kind of key points here. And these are really key points and phases. You have to really think about about how to actually progress through the project. Uh, so in January, I figured out some learn techniques. I did the mouse surgery, monitoring over the next couple of months, harvest the brains after 30 days. Use histology, and then proceed with data analysis and repeats, repeating these study with measures necessary in writing manuscript. I know this is a timeline and guide, um, not necessarily something that's accurate. <laughs> okay, but these are the key points that I can look at it that you have to kind of do all these phases to kind of move to the next step of the project. So here's what my actual timeline looks like. <laughs> so in the, in, the, in the first month, uh, it, was, it was mouse breeding season. So I looked, I, I put sleep there, but I, I would say I was learning through REN. <laughs> but uh, the, in the first month, there was a little delay because we needed to get our mice ready. Uh, after that, uh, we learned techniques. Uh, Dr. Mills was, was helpful enough, and he, he was the most senior person who provided consistency throughout the data. So I learned how to do the surgery, but he is the most efficient uh, doing it. And so the mouse surgery and monitoring period went on for quite some time, and it's still actually still going on. Uh, we, we've harvested a lot of brains, and again, the data analysis has been a, a work in progress with, with the uh, Santa Clara University um, engineering department as well. So again, I want to, you, you can't move, again, stress the points that you can't, it's hard to move through each phase without um, uh, first completing the task before that. When I look back on these things in my research process, did these things kind of can apply to a lot of things, but looking back, the fact that I, I thought about some, some key points that I did think were the kind of bucks during this for the seminar, which is you know, applicable to my project, but to everyone's. Uh, as Ani's pointed out, we have limited time during this uh, experience, limited time during the, the research project, so it's important to pick a project that you can maximize your time. And we also have limited resources. One of the things that I, I regret that I wish I had done a little bit more was looked at um, more aggressive in grants and funding to help with the project. 
that the most did a great job helping us in the department, but I wish I had been a little bit more aggressive with that. Um, inexperience is something you can't change, and something that we all have. And for some of us, like myself, this might be the, the biggest research project that you undertake, but that's part of the learning process, and um, you have people to guide you through that. And, and inexperience also might not, might not mean research, but maybe with a uh, database you're not used to using. So those are also important to know that that might not, that might make you a little bit less efficient than you might be during the process. Uh, speaking about my process in general, specifically in our research, I would call the natural process. Some things we can't control, some things we have a little bit of influence on. So the mice breeding, uh, we can control a little bit of what the mice uh, gene type is good for, but things happen. Not all the mice make it. Well, mouse nurturing, we have we had mice that were born that mothers didn't take care of, and yet some sort of animals die from technical failure. The last thing I want to put out on a road talk is refinement. So, when you, so what, what I mean by that is when you're looking at a research process, um, do you have a, a, a project that's already been, you know, it's been there for, for you know, months, years, there's a clear plan, or are you trying to retool things to make things better? Are you always trying to make things better, but sometimes the processes are we were retooling some of the objective measures and working with the new group. So it was a you know time frame for a little off because we were working with each other and feeling each other out and seeing how we could optimize what we could achieve. And so going next to that, I looked at you know with all these things in mind and looking at my, my research timeline, what did I think were some some very important points to success in that? Uh, so preparation, I think, is very key to that. So um, that that starts with a lot of things. So Picking, you know, picking an advisor, looking at different projects. Uh, you, know, you might not know what you want, but uh, preparing your time before your research time starts so you can maximize that. So I wish I'd done a little better uh, in with the, the, the mice, uh, the breeding season to get so we can hit, we could get the ground up and running. Um, mentorship very important in this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Most, for your mentorship during the process. But uh, it helps again. We're really experienced with this, so frequent meetings, things come up to you, communication is very key for that. Um, trying the best that you can to anticipate roadblocks, as you said, that's the end of that sets back to preparation. If things are gonna happen, um, but hopefully if you if you've thought about it, you can adapt to it and, and find ways to troubleshoot them. One of, one of the points I wanna stress also is goals, because during the beginning of the project, I have that you can establish goals, but you wanna make sure that you're monitoring them, so that, that you're meeting them and things are progressing. And another important point is, I think, teamwork. Um, and uh, we're inexperienced, and there's a lot of resources, so it's important that you utilize resources that, that are available to you. So when I, when I mean resources, I mean not only if, um, so an uh, example is if, you know, in the lab, we had uh, help with raising our mice. There's certain things that we don't know to do. There's PhD, student, PhD postdocs, a lot of people around that are, they're, they're more than happy to help you if you, if you talk with them. And, Provide you with their area of expertise, <coughs> not least the collaboration. And that's what we had um, a lot of members there to help us get this project along going. And I think, again, looking at who's out there that can help you and, and what they can offer is important because, again, you don't have that much time. You might not be experienced with some of these things. And the last thing is reflection. So during this process, just, um, I think you should think about how in the future you can make things better and what have you learned. And I think in my, in my specific uh, project, I was, you know, Pretty happy with. I, I've done basic research kind of with mice in the past. And I think, well, this could have been a little bit more efficient. We did, we did very, we did a very good job. I'm actually very happy with all the collaboration. We, we were able to work with multiple departments across multiple universities, and um, uh, it was a great learning experience. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Bones, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Yan, Dr. Santa Clara, Dr. Zed McNamee for doing the job. And thank you for your time. Any questions? Follow along from this research. What other research questions are there? Maybe Sam can help too on that. But how do you help to translate this to humans with those questions? So, with, with this project, we've had a little bit of time, so we didn't want to get too much into inject with, with drug injections, and because that, that, that requires uh, a bit more extensive thought process because it's self 
potentially another rhythm, because finally that should be the goal, is to get this and translated to humans. When can you uh, look at giving the complement inhibitor versus steroids, because steroids have a lot of side effects. But um, for this part, I just thought we wanted to determine whether the complement at this portion was, you know, A valuable, uh, I guess, tool for um, being a, a model in mice that could translate to humans. Um, I think um, next, if, if again, the results are still going, but I think if this term, the terms shows up to be something that's you know useful, we can look at uh, an inhibitor uh, in humans at some point. But like I said, with the drug delivery, it's it's, it's a lot more complicated because is it is it the dose? Is it the drug? The, the drug delivery model you're using, or is it the time frame? So I think that's something that's going to be a future direction of this project if something pans out. Yeah. We think that um, <clears throat> with the uh, with the immune system, there's a, really a lot we don't understand about the complex interaction between that and peripheral nerve recovery, and differences in CNS motor neuron and sensory neuron survival at different ages. There are kind of two distinct questions. I mean, um, I, there's a, I mostly work in the adult population. Most of the facial nerve paralysis I see um, is uh, injury related. Um, and so the whole question of juvenile versus adult thing is, doesn't really apply there. But there's a fundamental question about why there's this critical period for maturation of uh, motor neurons in the facial nucleus and other systems that occurs in mice and presumably in other mammalian systems. Um, whereby peripheral nerve injury causes central loss and, and then doesn't after a certain age. So why does that happen? Is the question I have, which has been interesting me for many years in sensory systems and in motor systems, is why does this occur? Um, and it's, we don't know. We don't really understand it very well. It has to do with selective pruning, perhaps, and the sensitivity of those neurons. And the immune system might play a role in that. That's one question. The other, clinically, is that you know, we treat patients with steroids often for peripheral nerve injuries, facial nerve injuries, and, and the evidence for that hasn't been good. We did a study a few years ago looking at steroids in this model and actually found that I mean, it was detrimental to the adults. Um, and that was sort of surprising. And this whole idea that a functioning, functioning portions of the immune system are important for peripheral nerve clear, uh, debris clearance and recovery. Um, and on the other hand, in some systems, uh, when you block certain parts of the immune system, it's been detrimental and sometimes it's been good. So there's a complex interaction that's going on, and steroids are like a hammer you're hitting a bunch of things with. So if we can understand a little bit more about it, I think it, it could lead to better clinical therapies and some understanding of what we could do. So steroids post-injury. Yeah. Have you ever looked at steroids prior to your injury, analogous to steroids used in neurosurgery to try to reduce mm -hmm. brain injury? No. I don't know that anyone has. But the idea by looking at the, the, the whole point of having the mouse model versus rats and others that people use for facial nerves, whereby it's easier to get quantitative analysis because they're bigger animals, mm. is that we wanted to use the, the genetic mm. library that we have because it's a very powerful tool. Pharmacologic studies in animals are just difficult. I mean, just you don't know what the dose is getting in, you know, you're injecting 25 gram pups and um, you know, some of it comes back out when you inject it, you know, who knows what's really happening. Um, so um, this is a powerful uh, way to look at specific aspects of the immune system, and that's why we wanted to do it for that model. But the challenge is getting quantitative data in those little animals. Mm -hmm. um, there are models in rats whereby they've, picked, they've, you know, they've actually glued something on top of their head to their skull, and then uh, trained them to sit in a device that holds them still, and then use a laser doppler to look at their whiskers. We simply can't do that with an animal this size. We looked at implantable EMGs. They don't have them for animals in size. But this is our attempt to try to get a quantitative measure of whisker movement. And Yula and Yang, of course, used to be in this part of the biology unit that you're working with. Well, thank you. It's a good start to the year. Mm -hmm.